Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Cruising your way on this episode of Off 90. Beautiful and exhilarating. We'll get a hands-on lesson from Red Wing's Gail Dahlberg on the art of blown glass. Austin may not be the biggest city, but it's brimming with bronze statues. Meet the man behind their stoic beauty. And poetry beneath your feet. Hear the poems of Mankato's word walk. It's all just ahead, off 90. I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Off 90. There's hardly any art form as exciting to watch as blowing glass, and we're giving you a hands-on lesson. We're headed to the Anderson Center in Red Wing, where several artists and residents work and teach classes. One of those teachers is Gail Dahlberg. He built the Anderson Center's glass blowing studio and has taught hundreds of students the techniques of creating beauty from molten glass. The basic ingredient of glass is sand. Turn it quicker, quicker, keep that, that's good. Angle here that you do that. So just keep thinking about which tool you're going to get. There's a magic to glass that stems from the changes that it goes through with the heat. You see the reflection below it? Yeah. That's how you can tell where the glass is. I'm Gail Dahlberg and I'm a glass blower. This side, here. I have no qualms being called an educator. Here the priority is teaching. Roll it and squeeze it, see how we're forcing it out? I don't think there's any limitation at all, it's just another artist's material. Gail's such a great guy. He lets us come out here all the time and practice glass blowing and it's been a lot of fun. He's got a lot to teach and I learned a lot from him. It has just been really wonderful. Um, really encouraged us to experiment and be creative and have fun. Um, and really helped me get me hooked on the last program. I'm currently involved with the Anderson Center here. The Anderson Center is um, a community of artists that there's short of 20 of us that have permanent studios here and all, all kinds of medium. I built a, a glass studio and we've been uh, teaching classes here for the last half dozen years. We've gone through hundreds of students. All ages, uh, all, ba all kinds of backgrounds, and they've made different degrees of commitment. Some of them have, have gone a long way, so have really gotten good and are, are, are hooked. There is a uh, a big need in, in this country, this world, for places to play. Even if it's for a half hour, hour to come and play with a, a material that one doesn't have a chance very often to, to experience. The glass itself in the tank is approximately 2,200 degrees. It's not much different than, than what a, a bricklayer has to go through working out in the sun all day. And there are people that, that are completely 
puzzled by the, the fact that you work with such a hot material. There are potters who, who deal with heat a lot, but uh, insist on, you know, it's crazy. My true appeal to glass is probably in the process. You shape it, transfer it, they're done, you break it off and put it in the annealing oven to cool. Glass blowing's been around for thousands of years. So. And, and a lot of the tools and techniques that, that we use here, the bulk of them are the same that have been used for a long time. You're working, working with a material that is, is affected by gravity. It's an issue of balance and, and control. not that demanding physically, it's just a matter of keeping it centered and balanced. It's so fast and it's really emotional, it's really immediate. There's a lot of ups and downs. You can be working on a piece for an hour sometimes, and then you lose it, and you have to uh, have to be okay with that, you know. Really, it takes your complete attention the whole time. Just one mixed step and one screw up, and that's the piece is gone. So it takes just complete attention and attention to detail. Glass blowing is full of things that are that are learned by making mistakes. There's a reason why we have so many trash bins. <laughs> With all the magic and appeal that glass has, it also has some limitations. It it takes a lot of uh, commitment. It takes money, it takes time. You almost have to eliminate other things in your life. It's not the type of thing that you can pick up like one picks up a piece of wood and, and, and does a sculpture or, or even a potter can work with the clay and, and put it aside almost requires a, a, a full-time commitment. I had two grandfathers that were tremendous craftsmen. And when I realized that as a young man, I, I thought, what a shame that between the, between the two of them, they had 25 children. And <laughs> none of those skills got passed on. It was one of the big voids in my life that the few things I did learn that should be passed on if they could.
a stroll around Austin and you might notice a significant number of statues in town. Pretty remarkable for a city its size. But where did they all come from? And why does Austin have so many? We spoke with Jeff Anderson, the artist behind many of the statues, who gave us some insight into their stories. My name is Jeff Anderson. I'm a commemorative artist and I own Anderson Memorials here in Austin, Minnesota. I'm fourth generation in my family to, to be in this type of business. About seven semesters into, a, into college, decided I didn't want to be an accountant. I'd rather, <laughs> I'd rather work with my hands. You always hear the term starving artists. And um, in, in our company, in our firm, we're one of the few, I think, types of businesses where we do art every day. I mean, day in and day out. It's a, it's a, our industry is hands-on. It's, it's sculpture, it's carving, it's uh, stone for the most part, but also a lot of bronze work as well. And just in the Austin community in general, we've, we've probably been involved in nine or ten different projects that we've done around town. And every one of them for a different reason and different purpose and by different people. We've probably got more artwork in the community and continue to have more as time goes on because I think people are appreciative of it. Each piece, I think, has its own reason for being. One of the pieces we put out recently uh, in one of the parks was, was made possible largely by funds that were left to the park department by a family in their estate. Um, other ones, like the Warleen Plaza there, um, were funded by their family as a gift to the community, and, and, and it goes on and on. The Warling family, of course, have prominent you know, members of the, the Austin community for years, and, and um, the boys, uh, Paul and John, basically uh, wanted to portray their happy memories of childhood and growing up in Austin. And so the, uh, the pieces, actually, the, uh, the man and the woman with the child on his shoulders are actually done in the likeness of Ward and Margaret. geese, of course, representing nature and their love for nature and the landscaping that was done there is, is I don't think anybody that goes there doesn't come away with a happy feeling from that park. It's just got a very beautiful feel to it. Peace sculpture is actually multifaceted in what its symbolism is. The base of it is a, is a large granite cylinder and represents the, um, the everlasting or ongoing efforts of this Zant organization towards their goals. It's, it's the hands of humanity, the hands of peace, creating all these different things through education and, and all these different aspects. It's, it's hollow on the inside and you can look inside of it and that represents the fact that sometimes we have to go down deep within our soul to be able to bring forward peace. And that coarseness in texture on the outside represents the fact that sometimes to preserve peace we have to be aggressive and we have to, we have, to have wars to protect peace sometimes. Uh, we wish it could always be smooth and, and even and, and soft like the inside, and we wish it could always be polished and bright, but, uh, but it's not. There's different ways that we have to, things we have to do to preserve peace. The Veterans Memorial is a project that we actually designed and um, back in the late 80s, early 90s. I'd 
basically did all the artwork and stuff in Soldier's Field, uh, the sculptural pieces on there. Um, uh, there's actually three different bronze pieces that are in that one. We finally got that accomplished and then just uh, uh, just a few weeks ago we, we then also brought forward a, a, a bronze eagle sculpture that we, we put on the pedestal out in the courtyard in front of the memorial too. The statue at the library was, is a piece, actually two pieces, that were done by Dennis Smith, who's a Utah artist. And uh, of course the one little girl standing, sitting reading a book, sitting perched on a boulder, and then there's a little boy on his, laying on his stomach just engrossed in listening to the story. And of course how appropriate is that for the purpose for the library? One thing we've got that's a big advantage in Austin is for the size community we have, we have a wonderful park system and some beautiful parks and great places to put sculptural art and, and a lot of significant messages to convey with the artwork that we're putting out. can come from some pretty unusual places. In Mankato, you just might find it right beneath your feet. If you walk along Riverfront Drive and visit Riverfront Park, you'll notice poems stamped into the concrete. The Word Walk was born after a poetry competition where the winners had their poems immortalized in the sidewalk for everyone to enjoy. <laughs> I have been working very hard on saying something in a poem in as few words as possible, so the word walk was perfect for me. It was a challenge to come up with something that's profound and short, very, very short. Maps of cracks and loose stones on hardened cement lead us home. I think that in a busy world when you're uh, working and you're busy, it's easy to come home and just write a poem. It's expressive of a lot of thought and feeling. It's relaxing. It is. And fun. It's great fun. One evening in 1988, the naked piece of her art shifted on cold concrete. From this point, her life became a sacrifice in a small Midwestern city. Poetry to me is uh, a lot of mental exercise. I, I like poetry that way, I do. It's a, it's a challenge to, it's a Kodak moment, you know, I mean, it, it is, you know, to get a poem is a snapshot. Here, the river rests its elbow before it turns north to meet the father of them all. Here we made 38 mistakes. We try very hard not to forget. Aging benignly. Ah, the terrible beauty of the not-so-perfect body. Well, it's such a challenge to write a very small poem. 
Yeah, and so I, what I usually start out is looking for a little surprise. And so coming up with words that normally wouldn't go together, such as terrible beauty, um, is the surprise. And then you look for um, the universal as well. You want to find something that everybody says, oh, I can relate to that. Uh, and you have to do it all in, in very few sentences. And that's sort of the fun. Uh, and I, where the inspiration comes, it just you just begin writing. The image of the concrete appealed to me. Uh, not so much that they were going to be set in concrete, but just having the concrete in the poem. Because I placed concrete in the poem. That, 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 that helped me to write the poem. Well, I'm, I'm active in the Twin Rivers Council for the Arts, and they were the one who approached the Southern Minnesota Poets, which I'm also active in, and asked if we'd like to be involved in a collaboration. And collaborations are so important in this day um, for the arts and, and getting um, the whole public on board to understand how important these things are and how relevant they are to their, to their lives. Um, and so that was the... The, the seed was, I, I was sort of involved in setting it up and saying, well, we should try poetry. And uh, the suggestion was to put poetry in the sidewalks. And I, I don't see how we could get closer to the public than having it you know, right there where people can walk by uh, while they're having a day in the park. Uh, Mankato is a really arts-rich city. We have a lot of different arts groups and the Twin Rivers Center for the Arts has really been a driving force to bring a lot of those groups together and to create something bigger in terms of the arts in Mankato. And they really have convinced business people and government people in Mankato that this is a really worthwhile thing to do. And so those groups have gotten behind it as well. And there was a real impetus to have a whole series of public art projects in Mankato. And this was really the first one to come about. Small boy rides bicycle by. No hands. I could do that once. He is I, yesterday. I am he, tomorrow. So we put together a, a call for poetry and we sent it out by a, a press release to a lot of media groups. We sent it out to various literary organizations around the state. And we received about 80 poems that went into the mix. Our independent judge selected the finalists, the poems that would actually get installed in Mankato sidewalks. Craving lunchbox love, I slowly open the lid. Fish smell breaks my heart. It just kind of all came together very nicely. The city of Mankato was behind it in terms of having the forms made that they used to imprint the poems and uh, choosing areas in the city where the poems would be located. And they are, of course, located around the pavilion in the Riverfront Park. Most of the poems are also installed in front of a business in the Old Town part of Riverfront Drive here in Mankato. I've never been published. I thought the first place to get published would be so cool if it was in cement. <laughs> and it ended up happening. Pretty neat. I got the same email too, and I have quite a few short poems, and so I just picked one that I, I thought might be good for this venue. I hope it inspires people to realize that poetry isn't some arcane, dry thing that's found in your English textbook. That it can be a part of public life, that uh, it doesn't have to be complicated and hard to understand. Of course, these poems are, have to be very short poems, and so they're very accessible. And 
they're a lot of fun and I hope people take away the idea that poetry can be something fun, that it can be part of the community. That's all for this episode. See you next time. Off 90. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.